I didn't plan on becoming particle physicist's enemy number one, but that's what I've been for the past years. Now that this time is almost over, I hope, I want to try and explain what happened and how I think we can make progress in the foundations of physics. Spoiler alert, not by building bigger particle colliders. I believe that many of you heard of me first because I was criticizing particle physicists' plans for a bigger collider, among other places, in the New York Times. Here are some of the reaction from particle physicists. Seriously, fuck you. This person does not need this kind of soapbox. I find your comments respectless. It would be a good idea for you to leave basic research. You do not have the spirit needed. It is one thing to no longer be able or want to continue to do physics research, quite another to foul one's own ex-nest in public. If you were wondering why there are so few physicists who draw attention to the problems with their own discipline, this illustrates the problem. Physicists are not exactly welcoming of criticism. But I didn't just wake up one day and decided to crap on particle physicists. I swear it's not what happened. I'd spent the previous 15 years trying to understand why the foundations of physics stopped making progress in the 1980s. I believe then, and I still believe today, that I know why. Physics is one of the oldest disciplines of science, and as the research area matures, it becomes more difficult to find new observations that do fit into the existing theories. They become increasingly removed from our everyday experience. Experiments become more difficult, larger, more expensive. As a consequence, serendipitous discoveries become incredibly unlikely. You don't coincidentally discover a Higgs boson. It took decades and billions of dollars to build a machine that could do it. The time of serendipitous discoveries in physics is over. But without new discoveries, we can't confirm new theories, and so progress slows down. This is what you'd expect. Indeed, that progress has stored per se isn't the origin of my worry. That progress slows as scientific disciplines develop is normal to some extent. No, my primary worry is the seemingly endless stream of wrong predictions that physicists have put forward and continue to put forward. You see, we don't have infinite resources. And if experiments become expensive, we must decide very carefully which ones to do. What happened in the foundations of physics is simply that physicists have been extremely careless. They've been throwing billions of dollars at useless experiments that didn't get us anywhere. This is why progress has stopped. For almost 50 years, they built new experiments because they wanted to test some shiny new theories, ideas like grand unified theories that predicted proton decay, supersymmetry that predicted all sorts of new particles, extra dimensions that predicted black holes at the Large Hadron Collider, and many other things. They didn't find any of those. Why? Because these ideas are mathematical fiction. They're not proper science. In the foundations of physics, you find tens of thousands of such predictions for stuff that they just made up. And this story isn't over. It's still going on as we speak. They're now talking about entire dark sectors of particles that you can't measure. And a new branch of nonsense production that I have to talk about more at some point is all sorts of modified gravities. The archive is now full of those. But we know that historically, New theories in physics have been successful if they solved a problem with the existing theories. The physicists at the time often didn't know this, all right, but it's evident if you looked at what worked and what didn't work. A new theory in physics needs to solve a problem, either an internal problem in the theories, like Einstein's theories did, or how the Higgs boson did, or a tension with experiments, like quantum physics did. The new ideas are not of this type. Axion supersymmetry, grand unification, extra dimensions, and hundreds of dark matter particles and weird fields. They don't solve any problems. They only solve problems that physicists have made up in the first place. These so-called problems are all aesthetic misgivings about the current theories. And so, based on historical precedents, 
This means that the new theories are very unlikely to be correct. This is the conclusion that I arrived at a few years after my PhD. Theoretical physicists and the foundations are using the wrong methods of theory development. The methods that they currently use have zero chance of succeeding. By the current standard, there are infinitely many theories that are acceptable. So the chance that any one of them is correct is one over infinity. You can see new examples of this almost every day in some press releases, where some group of physicists put forward a new theory for dark matter or for the Big Bang or some supposed modification of black holes. None of those are solving any problem. They'll all vanish in the big toilet flush of published literature. It's incredibly tiresome that this insanity is still going on. And because I became convinced that the methods that physicists use to make these so-called predictions can't work, I concluded that neither the LHC nor the existing dark matter experiments would find anything of interest, and neither would a bigger particle collider after that. This is why I stopped working on LHC physics in 2005, before the LHC even turned on. In 2006, I turned down a very well-funded grant, the Emmy Noether grant of the German Research Foundation, because that would have required me to continue working on beyond the standard model physics at the LHC, which I had concluded is all nonsense. It was my own mistake to some extent. I shouldn't have applied for funding on a topic I didn't think was worthwhile. But you see the problem. If I had applied for a topic that I actually thought was worth researching, I wouldn't have gotten the grant. In any case, I turned it down. I might well be the only person in the history of that grant who ever turned it down. The university couldn't believe it. They thought it was a mistake. My friends told me I'm nuts. I accepted instead an offer from Perimeter Institute, which was objectively far worse. The only person who didn't question my sanity was my mother, who simply said, you know what you're doing. But well, I wasn't so sure. You see, there I was in my late 20s with that great insight about how current theory development in physics is all nonsense. And then there were some 10,000 intelligent people who thought otherwise. Whom would you have trusted? Me or the 10,000 geniuses? Well, I certainly didn't trust myself. It didn't help that at the time I had serious mental health problems and I couldn't exclude the possibility that I'm just not right in the head. I know this sounds like a joke, but it isn't. If you've ever had a mental health problem, you'll know what I'm talking about. You can't trust your own judgment. So I considered this. I'm probably wrong. I might be crazy. But in the end, I still didn't want to waste my time on what I thought was nonsense research. That would certainly not have benefited my mental health either. So I went to Perimeter Institute and started working on something else. That didn't go well either, but that's another story which shall be told another time. But I kept track of what was going on in particle physics. The LHC turned on, it found the Higgs boson, that was the last remaining good prediction from before the nonsense era. It ruled out all the pseudo-predictions, as I expected. And then particle physicists started moving their predictions. They started saying, oh, it'll just take longer to find these things. We'll find it in a few years or after the upgrade. And then we'll find it with the next bigger collider. You don't have to take my word for this. It's all documented in the published literature. That was in 2015, and that was when I decided to write my book, Lost in Math. In that book, I explained why these predictions were almost certain to also be ruled out, and why physicists need to step back and think about what's going wrong in their discipline. Because this isn't normal. It isn't normal for scientists to produce wrong predictions for decades and just continue doing this. Something is very, very wrong here. I still believe that I made a good argument by saying we should focus on inconsistencies, but all I got was insults. And not because of the argument itself, but because of the conclusion that it led to. A bigger particle collider is a waste of money. 
particle physicists, meanwhile, doubled down on their stories, which got wilder and wilder. The new big mega collider that CERN wanted to build would allegedly test dark matter. It would test dark energy. It would tell us how the universe began. And so each time a particle physicist went and promoted nonsense like this, I was there to explain why it's nonsense. I know why particle physicists hate me, but what was I supposed to do? Look away and just let them deceive the public? Someone had to do it. One day, the head of my institute received a call from a small group of people who said they're physicists at CERN. They requested that I be fired. This story has been communicated to me by the person who got the call. I can't confirm that it's true, but I see no reason why he should have made it up. And it seems plausible. I've also personally had to deal with particle physicists who yelled at me during talks, after talks, and of course, on social media. Almost all of these attacks were personal. They were about me, not my argument. They'd say, Sabine just wants to sell books, which, yeah, I want to, but my book wasn't about CERN's collider plant, so... I recommend you buy 10 copies and burn them. Trust me, you'll feel much better afterwards. They'd say Sabine is bitter because she isn't tenured. But I stopped pursuing tenure long before any of that happened for personal reasons. And I'm not bitter. I'm a happier person today because I didn't give in and schmoozed with the nonsense producers. Though it's right that if I had been tenured, I'd almost certainly have kept my mouth shut about that bigger collider. They'd say I just want attention. I don't want attention, at least not for myself. I just want to draw attention to the problems that I see. If I could have done all of this anonymously, I would have much preferred this. I actually asked my agent about it, but he said no one would publish the book without my name on it. If you wonder how I cope with knowing that a hundred thousand people or so might watch this, denial. None of you's real. I'm probably not real either. Sometimes having a few loose screws in your head is actually a benefit. More seriously, if that's not what Sabina wants, then what does Sabina want? I just want them to think about what I'm saying, because the future of physics depends on it, and the future of science depends on the future of physics, and the future of our civilizations depends on the future of science. I believe I take the foundations of physics much more seriously than anyone else I know, with the possible exception of Eric Weinstein, but that's another story that shall be told another time. And this is the reason why I'm opposed to building this bigger particle collider. It'd be a disaster for the foundations of physics. It'd stall progress for another 50 years. It'd take up a lot of money, would encourage people to produce more nonsense theories, it'd do next to nothing for society, and it almost certainly wouldn't find anything of interest for anyone besides particle physicists. What we should do instead is focus on experiments in areas where we either have an internal inconsistency in the theories, like in quantum gravity, or an existing inconsistency between data and theory, like in astrophysics. Why, for example, do we not have a billion dollar research program for experiments mentally testing quantum gravity. This would, by all reasonable measures, be a considerably better investment. I also worry a lot that there is so little research on the foundations of quantum physics. It seems entirely possible to me that with all the quantum technology developments going on, there is a physics breakthrough hidden in the data already, but we don't know about it because we have no theory that tells us what to even look for in the data. There are a bunch of standard arguments that particle physicists usually bring up in favor of their big collider. I actually wrote a list for this about six years ago, to which I'll leave you a link below. I got one of the most idiotic arguments in reply to my New York Times op-ed from particle physicist Lisa Randell. It's what I call the money is wasted elsewhere to argument. In Randall's case, colliders are expensive, but so was the government shutdown. It's an idiotic argument because it admits that particle physics is a waste of money. 
Lisa Randall, by the way, got tenured for coming up with an idea for extra dimensions of which no one has ever seen any evidence. I don't want to pick on her specifically. She's the product of an insane pseudoscientific research trend. The people who are trapped in this for the most part don't understand it isn't proper science. In any case, Almost all of the arguments that particle physicists make for a bigger collider actually have nothing to do with that collider. They're instead arguments for some large science project. Any such large project would, you know, have a chance of spin-offs, benefit technological developments in adjacent areas, make a contribution to education and so on. And that's all well and good, but if you want to invest into education, then just do that. You don't need to also dig a 91 kilometer tunnel along with it. Well, as I just said the other day, I think that at this point CERN's large collider plans have small chances of succeeding, partly because of the general economic situation in Europe. I may be wrong because particle physicists have an extremely influential lobby among politicians, so I'm not totally counting them out yet. But what has become clear to me is that if not particle physicists, then a lot of other people now understand the problem with nonsense research in the foundations. So I'm cautiously hopeful that maybe, just maybe, I'll see progress in my lifetime. If this video inspired you to solve some big physics problems, a great way to start is with Brilliant. That's an app and website with courses on science, maths, and computer science. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. What you see here is from their data science courses, which they just released. They all use real-world examples, like what it means to go viral on X. Brilliant covers a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses on algebra or large language models, just what I'm interested in. And they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle, and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. And of course, I have a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabina or scan the QR code, you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days. And you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.